Thank you so much, Marcus. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. well have we you. are so excited. Thank you. And we are super excited to have you here today. Um, before we get started with our conversation, I want to read a little bit about you. Marcus Anderson is a former NFL football star turned cyborg anthropologist who has made a name for himself as an innovator and world builder. He's widely known as the founder of the World Education Foundation, which focuses on bridging the gap between academia, technology, and practical implementation in local communities worldwide. Marcus has traveled to over 83 countries and completed local projects in 22 of them. His experience has elevated him as a globally respected voice on the technological and social connections between humans, machines, and the planet. He's an expert in the future of education, urban development, diversity and inclusion, IP and data management, futures and cultural analysis, and enterprise performance. And if that isn't enough, uh, in 2023, he created a holding company focused on creating innovative businesses and intellectual property by utilizing emerging technologies to address some of the most pressing challenges, advance society, and bridge the gap between indigenous wisdom, modern technology, and future society. So in a, in a few moments, we will talk about his new book, but, um, I want to start with asking you this, Marcus. What kind of ancestor do you want to be? <laughs> That's such a profound question. Um, you know, one of the things that I, the way that I like to approach that um, is being clear in vision, right? Um, and really understanding that the habits and the rituals that I create on a day to day basis ultimately will define my legacy. Um, and it's not, you know, a feat to where like you set out a vision and you just automatically get there, right? There's a lot of concerted effort that it takes in order to step into a meaningful life. Um, and it's really a lot about self-reflection, uh, self-introspection, self-awareness, um, emotional intelligence. Um, and so honing on the components that I believe that can actually take you from a dream to a reality, right? Um, I think, you know, one of the things as humans, we have this ingenuity to create visions, um, to think big and to dream. Um, and we also have an ingenuity to be able to uh, manipulate the material world and to bring into something that is actual tangible, right? And so if we have that vision and we put the language behind it, I think everything that has come from that has been man-made has come from a story, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. written down, whether it's oratory, whether it's something that uh, has been passed down through generations, everything that's been created, you know, that's not God-made has ultimately uh, come from, from, from a story. And so being able to create that story in my life, you know, I want to be able to take the opportunity to create those um, habits and those rituals that align with my higher purpose, which I believe is to bring goodness into the planet, right? And yeah. to, um, you know, value uh, the things of humanity as well as our connection and our symbiotic relationship to this planet. And I think, you know, that shows up in a lot of different forms, but if I can actually, you know, align myself to where every ounce of my being is going towards uh, being concerted to creating something beautiful, uh, something correct, something in alignment with my higher purpose, then I would be happy with that type of ancestor. And ultimately that could, you know, be passed down to uh, future generations. You know, one thing that my mom always used to tell me is that you can accumulate all of the material things in the world, but the only thing that lasts once we're gone is what you do for others. And mm -hmm. so I think once we, you know, once I ultimately feel like my complete self is like being devoted to others as well as taking care of myself, of course, um, then I, I think I'll be fulfilled and, and be a proud ancestor. Well, first of all, thank you for being such a human now. <laughs> um, so I imagine that you have already written and defined and edited and, and really honed that story, but what are the steps? What can other people do um, once they have that story? which I imagine is a projection of what the future looks like. 
-hmm. What are the steps? How do you then get from the story to living it? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I can't speak of everybody because their modalities are going to be different, right? Like, mm -hmm. so for me in, in practice, when I was young, um, I would have this kind of little meditative aspect to my life that I integrated into uh, deeply defining and using my body as a litmus test of where I should go in direction, right? And so what I would do is I would get into these meditative states and I would ask questions. And for me, I would listen to my body and ultimately mm. see what resonated with me, right? So if it was uh, a question about travel, if it was a question about uh, communication with someone, if it was a question about dating, if it was a question about anything, childcare, anything of those natures, I would ask my body and I would listen to me for specifically was my heart. Right. Mm -hmm. So if my heart started beating fast, then I knew it was something that I shouldn't actually pursue at that moment. Maybe the timing was off. Maybe it just, you know, wasn't right, you know, for me to, to, to pursue that. Um, and then if I asked that same question and my heart was calm, then I knew I could actually explore that further and continue wow. to check in with myself as I was going through the process to see if I was still in alignment with that thing that I wanted. Right. And I think the body, sometimes we kind of uh, look outside for outside validation, right? And thinking that other things are going to define where we need to be, right? And I think the ego is not only about the inside and how you look at yourself, but it's also how society looks at you. So sometimes we're defined by other people. And I think if you would even ask your immediate friend group who you are as a person, maybe they have totally different outlooks on what that is right absolutely and so, <laughs> and so being able to 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 be self-aware in that aspect um i think the steps are really about that introspection and then actually doing the steps of using your body some people it might be the the, the stomach some people it might be the shoulders some people might you know get the, the temperature might rise so it's about finding what that litmus test is for you and then following that as your personal guide Fantastic. I, I just love that. Um, so maybe later on, we'll ask some question and see whose bodies tell them something about it. Um, can, can we talk about your book? The title is just so magnificent. Mm -hmm. Cyborg Anthropology and the Future of Meaning. Mm -hmm. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, as a cyborg anthropologist, um, you know, what I'm really tasked at is being able to look at the symbiotic relationship and really break down the barriers between humans and machines. So if we look at um, our past, um, probably from the dawn of civilization, we've always been integrated with technology, whether that's fire, whether that's clothing, whether that's you know early prosthetics, whether that's water ducts, whether that's agriculture, we've always been able to create this relationship. But the way that the cyborg kind of looks at it is that we want to take more of a feminist approach and dissolve those boundaries between us and it, right? So we get into a lot of the quantum theory of that as we look at um, ourselves and as we create these technologies, technologies are also creating us, right? They create us in how we communicate, just like having Zoom. 20 years ago, we might not, it might've been a little bit more difficult for us to all be in this digital room in order to express, sure. you know, the, and share these uh, ideas. Um, but we, we want to actually dissolve that, that as we are looking at uh, technology, we also have societal impacts, right? And so if you look at the younger generation, the way that they communicate, um, even the way that they, um, uh, what they're interested in, how movements are started, uh, the accountability, the efficiency, and the transparency in storytelling, right? All of those things are a plus, but then you also have some consequences where there's disinformation, right? You have artificial intelligence that, you know, may or may not have your best interests at, at heart. And so what we like to do as a cyborg anthropologist is really look and define, particularly in this book, is the historical concepts of where we've been with technology and how we've moved through every epoch of that technology to identify what is it going to mean in the future of you know when we all have integrated biochips or when we can live to 500 or if we you know uh, have uh, glasses that can augment our reality to where we can have our individual own 
uh, presentation of what the world means, right? Or if we're fed with certain type of information and subsets of, of the community start to create these, um, these groups or these concepts within their own groups, how does the future of meaning mean for a holistic um, and, a, and the totality of humanity? Right, um, a lot of people in my field they think of this concept called the singularity, right, where you can't tell the difference between humans and machine. So, what does that mean for us as humans, as anatomical humans, right now? Um, how will our our structures, you know, even if we think about some of the early changes or the changes that are going on right now, we use our mind maybe. 30 years ago, we would use our minds as more as hard drives, right? Where we would we would remember streets, we would remember numbers, we would remember certain types of things. Now we've offloaded that into other, you know, vision and voice um, uh, applications where they give us that aspect of remembering things. And we use our minds more of processors, right? So that's where I feel like we can tap into the creativity side of humanity that also ultimately uh, safeguards against just this total takeover of technology where we can create these symbiotic relationships of what our value is and what this tool set, this new tool set uh, that we have to work with. Okay, so soothe us about the anxiety that cyborgs, tech, bots, and creepy things take mm -hmm. over our world. Mm -hmm. How yeah. many of you, how many of you are there out there to ensure that things are good? <laughs> Hopefully there's plenty. Hopefully there's plenty. Um, but you know what? Like just as technology needs operating updates, right? Like sometimes your iPhone or your uh, your your Android will ask you to do a system update. Um, I believe that humanity is in that crux where we need to update, right? Um, what are what what is important to us? We need to find those values and those morals that want to take us through this next uh, transitional change. Um, and we really need to dig deep on what it means to be a human, right? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes innovation gets so far out ahead of who we are as humans because of capital markets. We always want to be first. We always want to be the growth. We always want to innovate. Sometimes it's good to just actually stop, pause. And, mm -hmm. and identify what the consequences or the unintended consequences may be in, in light of that innovation, right? I love it. You <laughs> know, uh, this week, our TNM concept is upgrading. Oh, so well, we're, we're right I think here. upgrading is something that we should do all the time, you know, just like not just doing spring cleaning in spring, but if you look at ideas that you have, um, analyze, well, is this still relevant or did I come to that conclusion when I was a child or at a time when I had limited input? Um, yeah, so 